We are now up to part 18 in our story about Disney artist Herb Ryman, an artist who was central to developing the Disney parks during the lifetime of Walt and Roy. When we last touched down into this story, we followed Herb Ryman as he adapted his skills with live action set design to help design Disneyland. Not only did he create the first unified conceptual map of the park, he also created a near endless series of concept drawings and paintings of individual lands and attractions. We also followed Ryman as he took time off work for outside projects, including illustrations for two popular novels. After working in the studio system for two decades, Ryman remained committed to his own artistic independence, continuing with individual projects that bore his name and his own vision as a way of establishing a personal identity in the art world, even though Walt at times pointed out that his work touched more people when he pursued projects with others at WED. Today on our podcast, we continue our story as Disneyland prepares to open during the summer of 1955. And so, if you're ready, let's go. The week before the opening of Disneyland, the park was filled with activity. It was a period of quick decisions, anxious moments, and towering problems. Large sections of the park, including Main Street, remained unpaved, many buildings unpainted, and many planting beds without plants. Likewise, most attractions were unfinished. The Jungle River ride was missing mechanical animals, including the enormous elephants that were its centerpiece figures. Flight to the Moon experienced electric problem so significant that engineers and operations managers were unable to test the attraction, ride vehicles in the Snow White attraction repeatedly jumped the rail, causing the entire ride to shut down, the lift system on Dumbo's flying elephants proved unreliable once the additional weight of passengers was loaded onto the ride, and the Casey Jr. train was unable to manage the steep hills once the engine and rolling stock were placed on the tracks. Despite these problems, everyone associated with the project understood that the park needed to open on July 17th for two reasons. First, Walt had already arranged for ABC to telecast opening day ceremonies, which would work essentially as a free 90-minute commercial for the park. Second, Disneyland Incorporated, as a company separate from Walt Disney Productions, was effectively broke. It had no more money to support construction. Disneyland accountants were already promising supply companies that they would be paid shortly after the park opened. If the park did not open on July 17th and didn't immediately bring in money through ticket sales, the park faced the possibility of being forced into bankruptcy. In those final days, nearly all Disney employees, even those that didn't work for Disneyland Incorporated or for WED, pitched in to finish the park. Ivan Earl, the lead art director for Sleeping Beauty, painted a mural for the Welch's grape juice stand in Fantasyland, as well as stage elements in Peter Pan's flight. Owen Pope, who oversaw livestock, walked horses along dirt trails and through construction areas while loud sounds played on a PA system to acclimate the animals to the type of crowd noise they'd experience once the park opened. The groundskeeping team, led by Jack and Bill Evans, used whatever plants remained to fill in landscape areas, regardless of the original planting plans. Once they ran out of plants, they simply trimmed down weeds and spray-painted them green to create the illusion of landscaping. Walt himself slept at the park in a small bed he kept in a studio apartment above the firehouse on Main Street. On the night before the park opened, he painted a stage backdrop for the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea exhibit, though ultimately this would be one of many attractions that wasn't ready to open on the park's first day. On July 17th, Ryman attended Press Preview Day, an event that didn't begin until the middle of the afternoon. In ways, it was an amazing experience for Ryman to see a park that two years earlier he had sketched out on a single piece of vellum. 
Some shops remained closed, their interiors empty and unfinished, some attractions were listed as coming soon, but the map he had once created over a long weekend was now before him, a collection of movie sets and rides, a park unlike anything previously built. Disneyland contained a castle and a spaceship, a muddy river and a western town, fanciful environments that rose up in part from Ryman's own drawings and paintings. Uh, sometimes my ideas wouldn't get anywhere, Ryman said, but most of my ideas were constructed exactly as I drew them. One later Imagineer would put it this way. Uh, more so than the look, Ryman was responsible for the feel of Disneyland. Though Ryman had previously walked through movie sets he had helped design, he was now in a much larger world that, in part, sprang from his pen and brushes. On press preview day, over a dozen TV cameras lined Main Street with their cords running the length of the area and, in places, arranged above the street as well. Guests came in by the thousands. Most had genuine invitations, but other groups flashed counterfeit tickets so accurate that the gate staff, newly trained, were unable to distinguish them from the real thing. The park hosted an opening ceremony arranged around Town Square, followed by a parade down Main Street with bands, dancers, antique automobiles, and a few celebrities atop horses and floats. Once the parade was over, guests were free to move through the park. Long lines quickly overwhelmed attractions. Within a few hours, nearly all of the Autopia cars broke down. Canal boats in Fantasyland stalled out, causing employees dressed in hip waders to tow them with ropes back to the dock. Ride vehicles in the Snow White attraction continued to jump the rail, and mechanical animals recently installed on the Jungle River began to sink on their sandy foundations. Beyond the rides themselves, a small fire, stemming from newly and quickly laid natural gas pipes, broke out in Tomorrowland. Restaurants due to thousands of extra guests ran out of food before the park closed. Looking over the situation, Walt understood that though on TV, the park had appeared as an appealing leisure attraction for many viewers, in person, as the afternoon faded into evening, the park was literally falling apart. To one family member, he admitted, things weren't going so well. To reporters, he explained the obvious. We still don't have all the rides ready. But he knew that many of these problems, though not part of the TV telecast, would appear in newspaper reviews. Though Ryman was at press preview day, later in life he chose not to discuss how Walt viewed these problems. Instead, he simply said that he was there at the park uh, with Walt. But Ryman was aware of the problems. Uh, Disneyland was a hurry job, he later admitted. Fantasyland was cheap and shabby. In terms of his reaction to the overall park, he quietly confessed, I was embarrassed as he understood that the park, as it then existed, did not represent its potential, nor did it fully reflect Walt's vision and the design work Ryman had lavished on it. Newspaper reviews, when they came out, were mixed, with many reporters noting the unique design of the park, but also listing operational problems that plagued the event. A reporter for the Los Angeles Times described the affair as a mob scene, noting that there were lines for everything. Another reporter titled his review, Chaos in Disneyland. Still other reporters speculated that the park would likely prove too expensive for the average American, even though all attractions were open without charge to press preview guests, meaning that reporters did not yet have a clear understanding as to how much an average American might spend at Disneyland. In the days that followed, Walt and Ryman walked through the park many times. Walt understood that designers and construction teams needed to focus on finishing attractions. To reporters, he explained that Disneyland had not been ready on press preview day and that he hoped that they would return at Disney's expense in the fall once all of the attractions were finished and that other areas, such as stores and restaurants, were fully operational. Walt hoped that a series of positive reviews in the fall would wash away any unfavorable descriptions published in papers over summer. Now that guests were in the park, 
Ryman began to see the project from a new perspective. He saw how guests related to the architecture and the environment, how they enjoyed being inside of a world that resembled the movies. No other park had ever used Hollywood set design as a controlling thesis for the entire project. As far as I know, Ryman explained, that came from Walt. Ryman also observed how guests responded to the scale model architecture. Most of the buildings at Disneyland were built at roughly 70 to 80 percent of their full-size counterparts out in the real world. Shop windows, too, were set slightly lower, allowing children to easily see displays. Lastly, the trains and the steamboat were built at scale to unify the park's visual presentation. Walt wanted the buildings all kept at a size that people would feel were very friendly, Ryman explained. They wouldn't be overpowered by the architecture. Though most guests likely didn't notice how the architectural scale was adjusted at Disneyland, Ryman believed that unconsciously they responded to the environment as it allowed them to feel slightly more important while they were in the park. Toward the end of summer, Walt released most wet artists, engineers, and architects from employment as Disneyland for the most part was done. Gone were the art directors who had overseen Frontierland, Tomorrowland, and Main Street. Gone were most of the architects. All of these individuals were accustomed to project-by-project project employment, working typically from film to film. But Walt kept Ryman, along with other key individuals such as Dick Irvine, Harper Goff, Marvin Davis, Ken Anderson, and Bill Martin, to expand the park and to create new attractions. Though these men moved easily from task to task, they each possessed one key role. Dick Irvine was the executive manager who oversaw the business of park design and supervised creative individuals. Bill Martin was a master planner, a man who could arrange art so that its elements were easily understood and developed by architects, engineers, and construction firms. Harper Goff, an artist with a long history at Warner Brothers, understood how set design techniques could be adapted for Walt's Park. And Ryman, perhaps more than the others, knew how to take verbal cues from Walt and translate his ideas into artful visions, pictures that approximated the dreams in Walt's head. In the hierarchy of Wed, Ryman saw himself at or near the top of the artistic pyramid. He created images that others would parse out into working drawings and architectural forms. A vision for a project often started with Ryman and then was passed to others who figured out how to build it. I'm an artist, Ryman said, and not a cartoonist or a set designer. The way he understood his role at times caused friction between himself and other wed artists, but it also placed him in close contact with Walt as he was often able to create images on canvas that closely matched the images Walt dreamed up in his head. Even while crews finished or re-engineered attractions, Walt wanted to expand the park. He believed that a healthy reinvestment policy, directing revenue toward new shows and attractions, was the key to repeat business. Essentially, he believed that customers would come back if there was something new to see. One expansion assignment that Walt gave to Ryman was to redesign the Native American village. The original Native American village, arranged near the dock for the Mark Twain steamship, featured two conical teepees and a fire circle. It was a small area where Native Americans discussed their culture and performed traditional dances. The new village would be at the far end of the river, on undeveloped land a couple hundred yards beyond the frontier train station. With this project, Walt again moved the design of his park in a new direction. The original Frontierland was largely modeled on the movies. It wasn't a representation of the Old West so much as it was a representation of the Old West as it was presented in film. But for this new village, Walt didn't want the Disney exhibit to be mediated by movie images. He wanted the village to more accurately represent the regions where Native Americans lived. In November, Walt asked Ryman, 
as he journeyed to see old friends in Illinois, to spend time exploring the Midwest, to identify landscape features that could be incorporated into a larger show place for Native American ceremonies, a place where, in that early vision of the project, a stage could be arranged to present the story of Hiawatha, as well as other Native American myths. Another area that Walt wanted to develop was a themed shopping district called Rivertown. This area would be built beyond the then-current boundary of Frontierland, roughly where New Orleans Square a decade later would be placed. Though the design of the new Native American village was tied more to history, Rivertown was another adaptation of a backlot environment. The idea for Rivertown likely came from the 20th Century Fox backlot, once home not only to Ryman, but also Dick Irvine, Marvin Davis, Sam McKim, and Bill Martin, all of whom remained on the Disneyland project after the park opened. The Fox lot contained not only a steamboat and a western area, but also a river town area similar to what Walt now wanted to build, a place for stores and perhaps one small attraction. Disneyland manager Fred Schumacher developed a list of possible retail establishments. His first draft included a few impractical suggestions, such as a pet shop that might sell small turtles or lizards to children. The pet shop was quickly removed from the list as uh, items sold there would be difficult for a patron to carry with them. The revised list included a doll shop, a nut shop, a candle shop, a spice shop, a woodenware shop, and possibly an old map shop. Shops that sold items tied to the late 1800s. All these shops would be small, between 200 and 400 square feet, similar to the smaller shops on Main Street. But unlike Main Street, where rents were roughly $20 per square foot, this back-of-the-park shopping village would have lower rates to account for the reduced foot traffic and various retail items that might not prove as popular as those sold on Main Street. Disney planned to charge either $6 per square foot or 25% of a shop's monthly gross, whichever was greater. The term for each lease would be for one year, renewable with a 30-day cancellation clause, which gave Disney plenty of flexibility to change shops or perhaps even the whole area if it chose. The area would also include one minor attraction, a magnetic house. Disney's magnetic house would be a structure built on a slant, which allowed for illusions. Water apparently would run uphill, chairs would balance by themselves on their back legs, and billiard balls would roll in strange ways across a billiards table. With these ideas in place, plans were handed off to Ryman to develop visual concepts. Beyond Rivertown, Ryman worked on another expansion area in early 1956. Though the canal boats in Fantasyland had been an opening day attraction, boat passengers had little to see. The boats mostly floated by dirt mounds and areas that were covered in weeds. Walt now wanted to dress the banks along the canal with miniature villages, the type of storybook environments that animators and background painters had created in his films. Ken Anderson oversaw the design of the gigantic whale at the start of the ride. Bill Evans oversaw the decorative landscape, but Ryman contributed to the designs of the storybook villages. He modestly explained, I helped to design some of the things back there. But other expansion areas represented a significant change in how Walt thought about the park moving forward. Even as Disneyland saw millions come through its turnstiles, with guests excited to explore the backlot environment, Walt himself asked interesting questions about the nature of his park. In part, these questions focused on technology. In 1956, Walt said, You know, Herbie, we've got to start thinking about automated figures. We can have shows like the Golden Horseshoe Review with live characters, but we've also got to have automated figures that talk and speak. 
And in part, these questions focused on design philosophies. When the park opened in 1955, nearly all areas had used cinematic set design to express visions culled from the cinema. But in 1956, Walt considered how the tools of cinematic set design might deliver experiences outside of those primarily found in film. He believed that his park might create places where American history came to life with visual complexity, much the same way that the five original theme lands explored visual motifs drawn from the screen. In this approach, he sought to develop three historic squares, each one displaying a different period of American history and a different region of the country. In short, Walt wanted to use the tools of set design, to create areas devoted to education. The first area started as Rivertown, presenting general market life along the Mississippi, but quickly evolved into an early version of New Orleans Square. In the 1956 and 1957 plans, this area featured the architecture of the French Quarter, complete with shops and restaurants, along with displays that told the story of the Louisiana Purchase. Some of the retail corridors of Rivertown were adapted into unique retail shops that represented the historic culture of New Orleans. But the focus now was not on shopping or the restaurants, rather on exhibits that related a unique moment in American history. The second area was initially called Gay 90 Square, later renamed Edison Square. It would present the architecture of turn-of-the-century America with facades themed after major American cities such as Chicago, St. Louis, and San Francisco. Gay 90s Square would present the story of robust invention, largely focused on electricity, at the start of the 20th century, with its story later arranged almost wholly around inventions created by Thomas Edison. But the square that most interested Walt was Liberty Street, an area earmarked for land behind Main Street that would present America's origins before and after the Declaration of Independence. In this area, the story of America's founding would be told through two theater shows, a combination of film, art, early mechanical figures, and an extensive outdoor area dressed as Boston from the 1770s. This square did have some connection to film, specifically to the Disney film Johnny Tremaine, which explored the start of the American Revolution from a young person's perspective. But the purpose of Liberty Street wasn't to simply translate the visuals of the film into a new themed area, but rather to present colonial Boston in a way that guests felt that they were interacting with history. To put this simply, Walt's gaze was no longer primarily on film, not even on history as presented in film, but rather on history itself. He wanted a section of his park to tell the origin stories of America, similar to Colonial Williamsburg, a living museum in Virginia that he had visited multiple times. To better understand how a historical event might be communicated through art and a unique setting, Walt considered projects previously completed by various web designers, which led him again to Ryman. Not only had Ryman worked on a long line of historical dramas both for MGM and Fox, he was then working on a project based in history for Forest Lawn. For this installation, Ryman was painting a mural that encouraged viewers to contemplate religious events during the lifetime of Christ. One day, Walt asked, Are you working on a mural? Herbie, unsure of Walt's interest, answered, Yes. Walt explained that he wanted to see the mural, also the building where it would be housed. Walt wanted to see the Hall of Crucifixion, Ryman said. He arranged for Emil Curie, Dick Irvine, Bill Cottrell, and me to go to Forest Lawn. We all rode in one car. Once there, Walt took in the building and the massive mural. Clearly, he was impressed because after seeing Ryman's artwork, specifically how a large format mural offered a firm sense of time and place, he wanted to include similar murals in Liberty Street, featuring scenes set in the 1770s, 
perhaps paintings arranged in the waiting areas for the two shows. But Walt also understood that Liberty Street would be a difficult project to build. During the park's early years, Disneyland Incorporated was partially owned by outside investment partners such as the ABC Paramount TV network who wanted to maximize profits. In 1956, ABC was overseen by a new company president, Leonard Goldenson, who wanted to extract profits from the park. Goldenson wasn't interested in creating new lands unless those areas were under written by outside sponsors. Moreover, Goldenson wanted Disneyland Incorporated to pay off its debts before it engaged in an expansion of this size. But Walt remained opposed to simply removing profits from the park. You have to spend money, Walt said. If I level off and stop, Disneyland will die. So I keep adding things like Liberty Street and Gay 90 Square, stepping back in history. But his investment partners at Disneyland did not share this view. To create Liberty Street, Walt estimated that he would need about $4.4 million, likely divided up among 13 investment partners. These investment partners would come in two varieties, corporate sponsors, whose names would be associated with one of the two centerpiece theater attractions, and corporate sponsors who would develop retail space within the land in part to highlight their own products. A manufacturer of contemporary furniture, for example, might sponsor a 1770s shop where cabinetry production of this period was demonstrated with more modern examples featured toward the back. To interest outside investors, Walt turned to Herbie to create illustrations of this proposed area, illustrations that would appear so real that investors could easily find their place inside this historical world. For months, Ryman worked on illustrations and paintings of Liberty Street. The media was as varied as the topics. For some, he used watercolors and gouache. For others, pen and ink. Still others, watercolors over photostats. The images depicted Boston during the 1770s. Independence Hall rising above the Liberty Tree strung with lanterns. A row of seaside shops leading down to Griffin's Wharf and the Massachusetts State House. Figures in his paintings suggested that the land would be a living museum like Colonial Williamsburg, with a woman drawing water from a public hand pump, couples gazing into shop windows, and a town crier ringing his bell. As was often the case, many paintings were arranged at eye level, inviting viewers to step with their imagination into the land. Ryman also took on a second role during these months, that of a magazine illustrator. Walt understood that some artists back in their art school days had developed expectations that someday they would illustrate articles and short stories, as in the 1930s, the most viable commercial artist in America, such as Norman Rockwell, worked for magazines. Though Walt didn't have a large New York publication like the Saturday Evening Post, the studio did publish Walt Disney's magazine, directed at a teen audience, which featured articles and short stories. Repeatedly, Walt assigned studio and wet artists work illustrating material included in the magazine. Though Herbie would illustrate many stories and articles for a Walt's magazine, among the first was an assignment to illustrate a lengthy adaptation of Johnny Tremaine, a story about the American Revolution. For this, Ryman produced a half dozen watercolors depicting life in the 1770s, a town nearly identical to the one he was designing for Walt's Park. As Ryman created concept images that would define the identity of Liberty Street, other WED designers worked to develop two centerpiece stage shows, one focused on the writing of the Declaration of Independence, the other on the American presidency. The stage shows would use film and limited movement electromechanical figures along with theatrical lighting to tell the story of America during its early years. When discussing why he didn't use actors, Walt explained, You can't have human beings working three or four shifts. We've got to figure out a way to have automated shows. One afternoon, Dick Irvine came to Herbie's office. Uh, Walt wants to do a show with all the presidents of the United States on stage at once at the same time. 
Herbie simply replied, fine. Then Irvine explained, Walt wants to come in here tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, and he wants to see the Hall of Presidents. Though the timeline was tight, Ryman said he'd put together something for Walt to see. That afternoon, Ryman outlined concepts for a show that would not only focus on colonial America, but also on the living legacy of those early presidents. I very quickly grabbed research from the library of the costumes, Ryman said. Of course, everybody knows Washington, everybody knows Adams, everybody knows Abraham Lincoln. Then Ryman considered how to arrange these figures on stage. To create visual variety, some presidents would need to stand, others would be seated. Then he considered how to position them. I know that Walt didn't like Truman, Ryman said, so Truman I was going to put behind someone else. Beyond basic staging, Ryman understood that the show needed visual movement, particularly toward the finale. The show, in terms of its visuals, couldn't just be a bunch of figures standing and seated on stage. Ryman, of course, wasn't responsible for the script. The narrative arc would be developed by others, but the show would also require a visual arc, a progression not only in story but in visual presentation. So I thought, well, I better do something, Ryman said. Ryman examined his options, how he might use symbols and color to create a closing message. He also knew that Walt liked to have the last word at design meetings to add one final element that expanded a show towards spectacle as though only his contributions might complete design work. It's kind of corny, Ryman explained, but I'll have the red curtains part, and the presidential figures will be in silhouette on stage, the red curtains will part, what will the audience see? The dome of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. It's dawn. What does the sky look like? It's long horizontal stripes of red, white, and blue, which dissolve into the American flag. Ryman believed that there was no way that Walt could top that. Lights lower on the presidents, bringing the audience's attention to the Capitol Dome, which then, with the sunrise, pulls in the colors of the American flag. It would be a beautiful closing tableau. It might also be a design where Walt, try as he might, wouldn't be able to top what Ryman had already created. By the following day, Ryman had four illustrations, from a focus on the presidents who spoke, to a presentation of all 34 presidents, to an image of the Capitol Dome at the start of the day. Shortly before Walt arrived, Ryman arranged the four sheets on a corkboard, creating the outline of a show. When Walt arrived, he looked at one illustration, then the next. He stopped when he came to the image that presented all of the presidents. His eyes squinted as he scanned the various figures. Uh, where's Truman, Walt asked. Ryman pointed to a figure in the second row, partially hidden by another president. He's behind that guy. Walt thoughtfully nodded his head. Uh, that's good. Where's Roosevelt? Roosevelt's here, Ryman said. Where's Lincoln? Well, Ryman began, Lincoln's right in the center. Then Walt came to the final drawing. Ryman explained his idea to close the show. Then the curtains part, the red curtains part, and we see that capital of the dome of Washington, D.C., and then it's dawn and the red, white, and blue sky streaks fade into, guess what, the American flag. Ryman stood there beside his four drawings, believing that Walt, for once, would be unable to add anything to increase the spectacle of the final act. But then he saw frustration move across Walt's face, tiny lines around his eyes and across his forehead that suggested he was searching for something, something he could add to this closing concept. He stood there for a moment, his face wrinkled with thought. But then his eyes brightened. He leaned into Ryman, placing his hand on his shoulder. I'll tell you how I'm going to top it, Walt said. I'm going to have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. 
Ryman simply nodded because he understood that the music swelling in the theater would provide the perfect accompaniment to his designs. He also understood that once more, Walt had managed to add one more detail to a design concept, suggesting yet again that no project was truly finished without a contribution from him. Designs for Liberty Street, largely developed by Ryman, eventually produced a unified land, a themed area that would exist just behind Main Street. As guests entered Liberty Street, they'd find themselves walking on cobblestone. Around them would be buildings that represented early American architecture from the 1770s. The stores included a blacksmith shop, an apothecary, a glassmaker, a print shop, linen shop, tea house, spice house, a cabinet maker's workshop, and of course, the silversmith shop where Johnny Tremaine in the film was employed. The shops would not only feature people making crafts, but would hold windows opening to dioramas. For example, one window might open to a miniature of the Old North Church with harbor ships in the distance. At the corner where the street turns towards the square, guests would find the Liberty Tree, also an element lifted from the Johnny Tremaine film. The tree would be outfitted with lanterns. Beyond it, the square featured two more exhibits. The first was a recreation of Griffin's Wharf, complete with two sailing ships anchored in the harbor. This was the location, presumably, where the Boston Tea Party had been held. A pool of water would extend to a scenic backdrop that created the illusion that the wharf led out toward the greater harbor. The other large exhibit was a scale model replica of the U.S. Capitol building carved out of stone. At the back of the square was Liberty Hall, a large building that held two theaters, one that told the story of the Declaration of Independence, the other the Hall of Presidents, where Washington and Lincoln spoke about the importance of the American experience. The figures of Washington and Lincoln would have only slight movements, like mechanical puppets. As Walt did not yet have the technology to pair speech movements and gestures with sound, by 1957, the land was completely designed. All Walt needed were sponsors, hopefully 13 of them. But no sponsors came forward. No companies wanted to produce a multi-million dollar civics lesson inside of Walt's movie-based theme park. The same fate awaited the other historical squares. No one wanted to sponsor Edison Square, nor did anyone want to sponsor New Orleans Square, at least the version of New Orleans Square that was arranged to depict the history of the Louisiana Purchase. The most significant hurdle, it seemed, was persuading companies that a living history lesson inside of an amusement park would not only be accurate, but popular. More than with any other area-based project in the late 1950s, Walt returned to Liberty Street, revising these plans in the hopes that companies would finally bring the necessary money to build it. Versions of Liberty Street and its various shows were modified for different possible sponsors and different audience situations. During pitch meetings, Ryman watched as his boss, often forceful, congenial, and reflective, became more outgoing and conversational. The minute he had to appear before possibly 15 or 20 well-known bankers or perhaps even people who were strangers to him, Ryman recalled, he turned on a little button and he was the most hypnotic, charming, persuasive character that anyone has ever seen. For months, Walt believed that WED would find sponsors if it partnered with the Freedom Foundation of Valley Forge, a relatively new nonprofit focused on youth education, to convince companies that this project would not only be interesting, but historically precise. Despite his engaging presentations and Ryman's captivating art, Walt never found sponsors to build this land in California, but embers of the concept burned quietly at WED for years. Unlike the world of movie production, where concepts were quickly developed, filmed, and discarded, Ryman was learning that designs at WED would have a different trajectory. Designs would be put aside, picked up, and then put aside again. 
Even then, Ryman saw that such a design process was likely to produce shows with unique depth, shows that assembled ideas from many designers who, over years, were allowed to reconsider and revise their plans until finally the money was there to build them. I'll be back next week with a new episode. As next Sunday is the first Sunday in September, we'll have our news and analysis episode. As Disney remains front and center in the news, there are many things to talk about, including Disney's struggle to elevate its stock price, which earlier this month had its lowest closing in nine years. Also, by next week, I will have gone through both the Florida and the California resorts so we can talk about what makes those parks unique for the fall season. Florida already has its Halloween decorations up in full force, and California will have them up by this Friday. Both resorts are adding some new experiences into the mix this year, which we will discuss next week. Also, if you're on Bandcamp, you'll find two albums related to projects that we discussed in today's episode. In our story of Herb Ryman today, we talked about Liberty Street and Edison Square at Disneyland. On Bandcamp, there are two albums that cover the development of these projects in depth. The first is called Unbuilt Disneyland Liberty Street. It's what Bandcamp calls an album. So if you click on it, you'll find four episode or four tracks that cover this topic from start to finish. It runs in all about 100 minutes, but covers the Liberty Street project with far more depth than we were able to give it in a series focused on Herb Ryman. Also, there's an album called Unbuilt Disneyland Edison Square, which in three episodes explores the development of Edison Square as well as a related project called Chinatown that Walt once wanted to incorporate into Main Street. If you're on the Bandcamp site, both albums presently are toward the top of our listings. If you're on the Bandcamp app, just scroll down to find the album covers. The Edison Square album features a photo of the father from Carousel of Progress. The Liberty Street album features a photo of the Hall of Presidents at Disney World. You should be able to find both relatively easily. As you know, We're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes, but the best reason to join is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. So, until next Sunday, this is Todd James Pierce.